So yeah, I'm gonna talk about a um, few insights into the shards ecosystem. Um, first of all, I'm Johannes Müller, also known as Straight Shooter. Um, I'm working on uh, yeah the standard library and compiler and other shards and stuff. And yeah, I'm going to start with a little short introduction into shards. Uh, I expect most people probably have used it when you're uh, using Crystal because uh, Shards usually comes uh, together with Crystal. And yeah, Shards is uh, the dependency manager and um, basically works you write a shard.yaml file, place a hello world as a name or whatever your, um, your shard or your project is named. Um, then the other uh, thing you need is, is a version. You need to give it a version and then you can add like dependencies and shards will automatically install them when you run shards install. That places or that downloads the dependency, places it in the lib folder and then the crystal compiler knows um, yeah, to, to grab those uh, dependencies and have them available in your code. Um, the way that this, this works is um, in the shard.yaml you have a dependencies property and then you define like uh, in this example a shard called kmal you want to have kmal and you tell it where to find that in this case it's a github reference to a repository on github um, but it could be like any um, git uh, url um, that can be uh, used as a dependency and shards then checks out the repository and you, if you define like some version you need or restrictions, then it will resolve that. Um, and it also installs the dependency of that shard. So Kmal, for example, depends on other shards that it needs, depends on, and then shards will resolve all these dependencies. Um, so um, shards really works just by checking out the Git uh, repository and it's, it just takes what you you give them, tell them what what's the location of the shard. In this case, it's GitHub the location. Um, so it, it completely works decentralized. You have don't have a, a naming service lookup thingy that many other dependency managers have. have. Uh, like when you have a node pre, uh, node npm uh, dependencies, for example, then you would just write the kbar the name or like in, in Bundler for Ruby, you would just write the name of the dependency and there's a registry which has all the locations and the dependency manager just um, looks that up and uh, knows, okay, Kimal is this thing and then I can get it there. Uh, Shards doesn't have that because um, it's, it works without a registry. It has benefits and it has drawbacks. Um, one of the drawbacks is that there's no inherent mechanism to, to look up these things. So you always need to name the dependency and you tell shards where to find it. Um, but that's the hard thing, like um, how do you know where to find a dependency when there's thousands maybe of, of packages available, um, then you need a way to, to discover them, to know which uh, you might want to use. And then, um, there have been some solutions to that. Um, you can Google or you can use GitHub search or for some years there have been a uh, number of, of services uh, available um, which basically act as a front end to the GitHub API and um, yeah, allow you to, to easily look up um, information about charts that are hosted on GitHub. So that's, that's nice, but um, it also only covers GitHub, or maybe if you do the same thing for, for packages hosted on other providers that could also work, but it's it's all, always limited to shards that are hosted on like a, a major um, Git provider. And you, you can't have shards that um, like you have hosted on your own server, server for example. Um, so a while ago, I started the project the Shardbox. Um, which basically is a curated catalog of shards. Um, 
and it also supports auto discovery of shards. So it can not only show shards that are in the catalog, but also other shards that um, are out there. Um, basically, um, this catalog has uh, three major functions. First of all, it provides a taxonomy. Um, so in this example code here, this is literally what uh, could be standing in the, the Shardbox catalog, which is organized in YAML files. Um, it would define a, a category name that is in this case web frameworks and a number of shards. Um, again, we have the example of Kema, which is a web framework. And so it's placed in this category and the GitHub reference there is exactly the same as in a shard.yaml file. Um, so Shardbox works exactly like, like shards. It uses the, the uh, actual shards code for downloading these things and then looks it up and yeah, sees what, what's in there. Um, so that's the discovery part. And then there's the next thing that's aggregation. Um, because sometimes you have not only one location where you kind of find a shard, but there are different locations. In this example uh, with Kema, there was, uh, it in initially started out uh, as a repository in the user namespace of Zeta. Um, and then eventually it moved to uh, its own organization on GitHub. So the, the GitHub uh, handle changed uh, over time. Um, but the old one still actually works and there are really um, still uh, at this moment shards there which rely on the old um, GitHub handle, still use that in, in versions that are uh, released this year um, because GitHub just uh, redirects and so this this is the, th the same thing. Um, but we don't want to, to show, to have them show up as, as different shards because there are different locations, but refer to the same shard. So Shardbox has a feature to um, define mirrors of uh, like alternate uh, locations where you can get the same shard and they, it, it all um, aggregates them together to, to have the same shard um, represent, representation. Um, and this is actually happening quite a lot because um, projects evolve from personal namespace to user uh, to organization namespaces or because maintainers change and then the location changes and you don't want to to have that all um, tracking um, on on the, the user end or you want to present in Shardbox what's the what's the main thing but also accept all the other ones and combine them into a single shard um, entry. So um, while building this chart box um, thing, I had some yeah, insights. One of them, keeping complex evolving data strictly synchronized with the DB representation is not trivial. I thought it was a super simple idea to place the catalog in YAML files and then occasionally when it changes, um, synchronize that with uh, the database. Um, that's kind of modeled uh, after the um, I think uh, the mechanism how uh, Ruby toolbox works, um, which is uh, known in the Ruby community as a similar service, but it's only does the taxonomy part um, because there's Ruby gems, which uh, has like the registration and discovery part covered. Um, but it's it's really not that easy when you have to do that. Um, I won't go into the, to the, to the details because of time, um, but it, it um, so it, it looked uh, simpler than it was eventually. Um, then the next insight is errors. You get a lot of errors when you check out thousands of uh, shard releases every day um, because stuff just doesn't work. Um, but that's uh, how, <laughs> how things are because there's no enforcement to this. Um, so the next insight is shards can break um, because you have like invalid YAML or you have um, some some Git version tagging going wrong, um, but the good thing is um, it basically works in most cases, and, and that's fine. Um, so I think most people um, users of shards um, don't uh, usually have problems with it, but there are some. 
Um, so next I'm going to show you a few metrics that I have extracted from the data available at the chart box. Like this is um, the number of new releases that have been uh, published uh, per month um, for the last like about five years. And what's interesting about this that the average has ne nearly stayed the same over the last five years, even though Crystal has evolved and we now have lots of mo lots of more shards than five years ago. Um, the number of releases is stagnating uh, of new new re releases, right? Um, but I think it kind of the the reason for this is that old shards are either not receiving new releases because they are either feature complete or maybe they're just abandoned, so there's no new releases. Um, or they are maturing more and more, and so they receive less and less uh, new releases. Um, what's also interesting is like in the last um, six or four months, there haven't, haven't been as much releases as in the first half of this year. Um, but when you look at the, the high points, that was in April and June, um, that's all the, also the time when the last um, releases of Crystal were, were made. So probably it shows that um, shards update when there's a new Crystal release, which is probably a good thing. Um, yeah. So um, that's gonna, now I'm gonna round up the talk. Um, I have a few ideas for the future of Shardbox, how to develop it further. Um, just popping that in here. I want to uh, provide a JSON API for external access and the search API should be improved. Um, the categorization through the YAML catalog repository is not ideal. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna need new ways to better do that for people to, to categorize uh, shards. Um, API documentation would be great. I'm not sure if this should be part of Shardbox or like an attached project, but I would really like to have a link on every Shard page to go to the API documentation, even if the, the author doesn't provide some. Um, so, and then it would be really nice to get automatic notification when your dependency updates. So you could like uh, have a subscribe to a feed or something. That would be pretty swell, I think. Um, health analysis, another thing like the, the data that we have could uh, help to tell how healthy is a shard. Is it regularly updated or is it, is it maintained? Does a, as it have lots of specs and run smoothly? And yeah, that can, code metrics can help for that. I'm happy to have people help out uh, if you want to improve this stuff with me. And yeah, I'm gonna be working on it in the next months.